Landon Rychkowski, hydrologist with the White Mountain National Parks, and he's going to be speaking about the application of LIDAR to watershed management on the White Mountain National Parks. Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, basically I'm just here to let you guys know what we're up to as it pertains to LIDAR and how we're using it. Uh, so I'll start out with uh, just a brief introduction on LIDAR in case you're not familiar and uh, tell you why I think it's so cool. Um, give you an overview of the uh, status of LIDAR in New Hampshire. Uh, also the current applications uh, in the White Mountain National Forest, how we're using it right now, uh, how we're planning on using it in the very near future, and uh, kind of look a little forward in time about how we might use it um, more into the future, maybe ways that we're not even thinking of right now. Uh, so what is LIDAR? Uh, it stands for Light Detection and Ranging. Um, it's basically an uh, optical remote sensing technique in natural resources, typically this is done from an airplane. Uh, we shoot lasers down to the, uh, to the surface and it reflects back uh, the laser and then it uh, interprets uh, the distance of that object. Um, and the result is a massive point cloud data set um, that includes the top of the canopy, uh, the ground surface, and anything in between there. Uh, so with this massive uh, cloud of data set, you can do all kinds of gymnastics to get all, you know, all kinds of different stuff. Uh, mostly what I'm interested in as a watershed hydrologist is the ground surface. So LiDAR is really cool. Um, uh, basically, you can create a map of the tree canopy, ground surface, um, and it's an actual measurement technique. Um, so where like your typical digital elevation modeling will be derived from a topo map, um, not an actual measurement, this is a real measurement of the, of the surface. Uh, it can be performed at very high resolution. Um, the resolution could depend on your, on your interests and your objectives. And uh, you can also take repeated measurements over time. Um, this allows you to detect ecosystem changes or you know, any changes over time in whatever you're looking at. Uh, so on the left here is an image of uh, your typical uh, DEM, digital elevation model, uh, 10 meter, derived from the topo maps. Um, and uh, you know, you can kind of get an idea of what's going on. There's a ridge line here, you know, some uh, stream here, over here, up here. But it's you know, really too hard to really tell much of a story about what you can actually see going on in the watershed. Um, I just happened to pick one tile in an area that I'm currently working for a potential project. Um, so however, when you move over, over to the LiDAR image, uh, we can start to see you know, ac actual ground surface features, um, things on the ground that can help you tell the story about what's going on in this watershed. Uh, for example, this ridge line here is much better defined. Um, here's a, a stream coming down where you see right here. But now all of a sudden you can see that this is a very large alluvial fan deposit, and we didn't really get that information from this. Um, so here's kind of the canyon where it comes out and deposits a bunch of sediment here. So here we can kind of interpret this area as, as an area where it's going to be geomorphically unstable, uh, varying patterns of erosion and deposition um, happening in this location. And we also have this feature right here, a big flat spot. Um, any guesses on what that might be? It's a wetland. Yeah, it's a wetland. You can see that yeah. So, yes, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Huh? So, how did this woodland form? Well, it was basically dammed up by this big sediment deposit from this alluvial fan. Uh, so, the stream comes down, hits these deposits, and we create this wetland here. So, the DEM, you can't really be able to tell any, any of these stories. So, just from this one tile, we can start to see, you know, see the watershed in a different way and get a lot of insight on it, you know, in just a couple of minutes' time. And you can also see the, uh, there's some drainages here in the, on the DEM that you know, say, okay, well, there's some drainages coming off the slope. Uh, but then when you go to the actual LIDAR, um, you can get a lot better idea of what they are just because of actual measurements of the ground surface. So in New Hampshire, almost the entire state is, has complete coverage. Um, hopefully within the next year, the goal is to have complete coverage of New Hampshire. Uh, we're just missing a big chunk of the national forest there in parts of the northern New Hampshire. And yeah, that, if you want to write down that website, that's where to go for LIDAR information in New Hampshire. 
so getting into current applications, how the White Mountain National Forest right now is, is using LiDAR data. Uh, one example is uh, we contracted with the US Geological Survey to update the watershed boundary data set. Uh, the watershed boundary data set uh, is part of the NHD, the National Hydrography data set. And anytime you use GIS and you throw a watershed on there, this is what it is. Um, so using LiDAR, we can really refine these, these boundaries. So what's shown right now is, is the current watershed boundary data set, which is derived from topo maps. Mm -hmm. um, and you can kind of, if you look real close, you can kind of see some areas on here. Like right here, for example, where it doesn't exactly follow the topography. And uh, I think down here, there's another spot um, right here. So, you know, it's, it's good, but it's not perfect. Um, so, for example, if, if the Forest Service is planning a, a timber sale, you know, right here, we kind of need to know what watershed that's in so that we can, you know, monitor effects or, you know, whatever we're going to do. Um, so that's going to be a, a big help. Um, so that's kind of step one with the LiDAR right now, is get those refined, and uh, that will happen automatically. You won't even know it happened. Next time you download your latest version of the NHD uh, or watershed boundary data set, which I recommend you do at least once a year because these things are going to be changing. Uh, it'll, all, it'll all automatically be updated for you. So we'll have that. Uh, the next step is to delineate HUC 14 and HUC 16 watersheds. Uh, basically, what that means is we're going to kind of narrow down smaller watersheds. Uh, so, this is uh, an image of a, a HUC 12 watershed. Um, this is a Millbrook Pemigewasa River, if you're familiar with Hubbard Brook. Uh, this is the Hubbard Brook watershed. Uh, so, basically, this is what it's going to look like is you have um, a HUC 12 watershed, uh, which in a lot of cases for the Forest Service is kind of too big of an area to be looking at. Uh, for example, the, the project where I was looking at uh, where the DEM liner image is up here. Uh, so if we do a project here and, you know, our cumulative, cumulative effects analysis, normally we choose kind of like a HUC 12 watershed. <coughs> Um, do we really want to be considering what's going on in here while we're, our project is way over here in Millbrook? Uh, probably not. So to be able to delineate smaller watersheds, um, it's really going to help us manage to get a better focus um, and kind of only look at the areas of the landscape where we're actually going to be impacted. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like where you have, this would be a HUG 14, like all the colors here would be HUG 14, and uh, like in Hubbard Brook, to start to delineate these smaller watersheds up here, um, will be more like a HUD 16. We're also uh, partnering with the New Hampshire Geological Survey uh, to use our LiDAR data um, to update the NHD flow lines. Uh, so basically, uh, Neil Olson from the New Hampshire Geological Survey has created a, a model uh, to predict locations of flow lines. Uh, so this image shows um, the NHD, which are the, all the blue lines. Uh, this is what we currently have um, on a, if you open up GIS and put your flow lines on there, this is what you're looking at. Or if you grab a topo map, a paper topo map, same thing. Uh, NHD flow lines are just digitized from that topo map. Um, so kind of take notice of all these areas where the, the blue lines don't line up with the other lines. It's, it's fairly irregularly. Um, so the, the different colors on here, um, so the purple are lines that I haven't field visited yet. So I'm in the process of uh, field verifying this model to see what flow lines should be there, shouldn't be there, and whether they're intermittent or perennial. So all the dark green lines, uh, such as down here, are perennial flow lines on the ground. Um, and you can see this one here is a perennial stream that's totally missed by the NHD. Um, not really that uncommon uh, in the White Mountain National Forest yeah. Mountains where people don't get to very often. Um, and you can also see what's going on here in this alluvial fan. Um, the NHG has a flow line that's kind of cutting right through the middle of it. Uh, and currently, this is the actual main stream channel. It goes through here. And this tributary comes in and has been pushed to the margin of this alluvial fan by these deposits. Um, so where the NHG had it coming in uh, way up here. Well, yeah, basically, the NHG had it coming up in here. The actual flow line comes down here along the edge and doesn't come out until way down there. Um, and this is important because you can also see a road going through here. And we actually have a culvert here and a culvert here. 
So in our culvert layer, we'd say there's two culverts, but if you're just looking at HD, you see a, you know one streamline that's not even where your culverts are. So uh, this will be a big improvement for us, uh, you know, as we manage our our projects and our watersheds. Uh, also, uh, the soil scientist in the office, Andy Coulter, is uh, also working on his PhD at UNH. Um, and he's working on a, uh, a kind of a significant project with uh, mapping terrestrial ecological units and moving towards a forest-wide soil survey. Uh, the soils in the White Mountain, White Mountain National Forest are not uh, currently mapped. Um, so this is part of an effort to, to do that, um, kind of a, a new way of thinking rather than just you know, digging holes and extrapolating everything else from your soil series. This is kind of looking at landscapes, looking at vegetation, uh, combining it into a more holistic way to create a soil map that makes more sense for management. Um, instead of just, you know, the, the goal of a typical soil survey is to find what soil series you're on. But as managers, we don't really care what series it is. We want, we want to know how it behaves and how to manage it. Um, so basically, <coughs> delineating uh, geomorphic landforms uh, we know that soils within similar landforms are going to be similar, so we can create a much more, uh, you know, an improved map in a more efficient way. And this is Mount Moose Law, by the way. Uh, another thing we're planning for the very near future, um, and kind of an in-development idea, is to map potential vertical pools using LiDAR data. Uh, vertical pools are important uh, for a variety of wildlife, especially amphibians, frogs, salamanders, and such. Uh, right now, our, our method of uh, identifying vernal pools is just getting people out on the ground and hiking around and looking for them. So that's not a very efficient use of time. It's fun, but um, you know we miss a lot, so we really need to know where they are located. Uh, we're also looking at, uh, we have a pending contract with the U.S. Geological Survey to do flood hazard analysis at campgrounds uh, that are in or near floodplains. Uh, so we have six different campgrounds that are in, in potential hazard zones. Um, this is the Pasacana Way campground off the Kankamegas Highway. Uh, this is the Swift River. And, uh, and you can see some evidence of you know, flood waters that have moved right through the middle of the campground at some point in time. Uh, we're also looking at just more general floodplain delineation. Um, uh, so this is the Mad River, uh, just upstream from Campton. Um, so using the LiDAR data to create uh, flood maps that uh, we don't really have FEMA mapped floodplains uh, very typically in the, in the forest or nearby. Um, and so this is kind of a you know an actual measurement of where's a hundred year floodplain that you know, we can get it from this. Uh, we're also going to be installing some uh, new stream flow sensors around the forest, um, and the typical method for uh, relating uh, stream stage or the elevation of the water to a, a flow is to take a whole bunch of discharge measurements um, you know, throughout the year, across years, and, and create a curve that way. Um, but with LiDAR, we can actually use HECRAS, insert all the elevation data into HECRAS, and basically model the, uh, the discharge based on your uh, river stages. So it'll be, uh, you know, it's not going to be as perfect as a bunch of actual measurements. Um, but for the Forest Service, we don't necessarily need to be perfect, we just need an idea of what's going on. So this is going to be a, a big time saver. Uh, we also want to be looking at uh, identifying straight and stream reaches. Uh, we look at uh, uh, the White Mountain National Forest and all of New England, really. Um, this is one of, the, one of the bigger reasons why we want to be looking at stream restoration. So this is really going to help us identify um, you know, where to focus our efforts when we think about restoration. Um, we have an 800,000 acre forest, so it's kind of daunting to think about you know, where do you want to go to, to make a difference. Um, so this is kind of one step in, into identifying you know, where we can go. So in the future, um, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the future. Um, but some examples of what we might get into is some advanced vegetation analysis. Um, some of the people earlier today have been you know, sharing some ideas that they had. Um, and, you Pair this with multi or hyperspectral imagery, uh, maybe maps trees and species, um, quantify landscape changes over time or disturbance mapping. Um, this is really getting into more advanced analysis of that point cloud I was talking about. Um, so that's fantastic, but the problem with that is it takes a lot of time to you know, dig through all that data um, and really it's a big effort. Uh, 
Um, and then big question marks is, you know, in the next couple years, we're probably going to have, you know, new ideas, uh, new technologies, and new techniques to, you know, to do new things that we're not even thinking of right now. Um, and I just want to also echo uh, Carl Honkinen's uh, message earlier today. We're really depending on partnerships um, and collaborations to get all this work done. Um, I'm one hydrologist on the whole forest. I can't do everything. I want to, but no way. So if any of you have ideas, um, you know, come to us and we'll see if we can work together. Any questions? Yeah, for sure that's you know, going to be a, an important use of 